Grizzlies Growls presents Stories from the Hibernation, read by David Grizzly Smith. Hello, and welcome back for Federalist number 14. Objections to the Proposed Constitution from Extent of Territory Answered You know, I do love reading these older works aloud for you. I like to think it adds a living energy to words to which you and I have paid far too little attention for far too long. I've mentioned I don't read ahead very much to keep the material fresh for me. I like surprises as much as you folks do. How much of the Federalist Papers are... Rather calm, rather clerical, rather tame. And the first part of this essay is much the same. But towards the end, there's quite a crescendo, let me tell you. Now, this one purports to be written by James Madison, though the Alexander Hamilton Awareness Society argues that most, or all, were written by Hamilton. It's possible. But it seems to me the more fiery essays do seem to be attributed to Madison. So, it's an intriguing question. And it's nice to find an intriguing question about something written 230 years ago. Hope I do it justice. Good day. The Federalist Papers, Essays on the New Constitution, written by Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, and James Madison, under the nom de plume of Publius, read by David Grizzly Smith. Federalist number 14. Objections to the Proposed Constitution from Extent of Territory Answered From the New York Packet Friday, November 30, 1787 Author, James Madison To the people of the State of New York We have seen the necessity of the Union as our bulwark against foreign danger, as the conservator of peace amongst ourselves, as the guardian of our commerce and other common interests, as the only substitute for those military establishments which have subverted the liberties of the old world, and as the proper antidote for the diseases of faction, which have proved fatal to other popular governments, and of which alarming symptoms have been betrayed by our own. All that remains within this branch of our inquiries is to take notice of an objection that may be drawn from the great extent of the country which the Union embraces. A few observations on this subject will be the more proper, as it is perceived that the adversaries of the new Constitution are availing themselves of the prevailing prejudice with regard to the practicable sphere of Republican administration in order to supply, by imaginary difficulties, the want of those solid objections which they endeavor in vain to find. The error which limits Republican government to a narrow district has been unfolded and refuted in preceding papers. I remark here only that it seems to owe its rise and prevalence chiefly to the confounding of a republic with the democracy, applying to the former reasonings drawn from the nature of the latter. The true distinction between these forms was also adverted to on a former occasion. It is that, in a democracy, the people meet and exercise the government in person. In a republic, they assemble and administer it by their representatives and agents. A democracy, consequently, will be confined to a small spot. A republic may be extended over a large region. To this accidental source of the error may be added the artifice of some celebrated authors whose writings have had a great share in forming the modern standard of political opinions. Being subjects either of an absolute or limited monarchy, they have endeavored to heighten the advantages or palliate the evils of those forms 
by placing in comparison the vices and defects of the Republican, and by citing as specimens of the latter the turbulent democracies of ancient Greece and modern Italy. Under the confusion of names, it has been an easy task to transfer to a republic observations applicable to a democracy only, and among others, the observation that it can never be established but among a small number of people living within a small compass of territory. Such a fallacy may have been the less perceived, as most of the popular governments of antiquity were of the democratic species, and even in modern Europe, to which we owe the great principle of representation, no example is seen of a government wholly popular, and founded at the same time wholly on that principle. If Europe has the merit of discovering this great mechanical power in government by the simple agency of which the will of the largest political body may be concentrated— and its force directed to any object which the public good requires, America can claim the merit of making the discovery the basis of unmixed and extensive republics. It is only to be lamented that any of her citizens should wish to deprive her of the additional merit of displaying its full efficacy in the establishment of the comprehensive system now under her consideration." As the natural limit of a democracy is that distance from the central point which will just permit the most remote citizens to assemble as often as their public functions demand, and will include no greater number than can join in those functions, so the natural limit of a republic is that distance from the center which will barely allow the representatives to meet as often as may be necessary for the administration of public affairs." Can it be said that the limits of the United States exceed this distance? It will not be said by those who recollect that the Atlantic coast is the longest side of the Union, that during the term of thirteen years the representatives of the states have been almost continually assembled, and that the members from the most distant states are not chargeable with greater intermissions of attendance than those from the states in the neighborhood of Congress." That we may form a juster estimate with regard to this interesting subject, let us resort to the actual dimensions of the Union. The limits as fixed by the Treaty of Peace are, on the east, the Atlantic, on the south, the latitude of 31 degrees, on the west, the Mississippi, and on the north, an irregular line running in some instances beyond the 45th degree, in others falling as low as the 42nd. The southern shore of Lake Erie lies below that latitude. Computing the distance between the 31st and 45th degrees, it amounts to 973 common miles. Computing it from 31 to 42 degrees to 764 miles and a half. Taking the mean for the distance, the amount will be 868 miles and three-fourths. The mean distance from the Atlantic to the Mississippi does not probably exceed 750 miles. On a comparison of this extent with that of several countries in Europe, the practicability of rendering our system commensurate to it appears to be demonstrable. It is not a great deal larger than Germany, where a diet representing the whole empire is continually assembled, or than Poland before the late dismemberment, where another national diet was the depository of the supreme power. Passing by France and Spain, we find that in Great Britain, inferior as it may be in size, the representatives of the northern extremity of the island have as far to travel to the National Council as will be required by those of the most remote parts of the Union. Favorable as this view of the subject may be, some observations remain which will place it in a light still more satisfactory. In the first place, it is to be remembered that the general government is not to be charged with the whole power of making and administering laws. Its jurisdiction is limited to certain enumerated objects which concern all the members of the Republic, but which are not to be attained by the separate provisions of any. The subordinate governments, which can extend their care to all those other subjects which can be separately provided for, will retain their due authority and activity. Were it proposed by the plan of the Convention to abolish the governments of the particular states, its adversaries would have some ground for their objection. 
though it would not be difficult to show that if they were abolished, the general government would be compelled by the principle of self-preservation to reinstate them in their proper jurisdiction. A second observation to be made is that the immediate object of the federal constitution is to secure the union of the thirteen primitive states, which we know to be practicable, and to add to them such other states as may arise in their own bosoms or in their neighborhoods, which we cannot doubt to be equally practicable. The arrangements that may be necessary for those angles and fractions of our territory which lie on our northwestern frontier must be left to those whom further discoveries and experience will render more equal to the task. Let it be remarked in the third place that the intercourse throughout the Union will be facilitated by new improvements. Roads will everywhere be shortened and kept in better order. Accommodations for travelers will be multiplied and ameliorated. An interior navigation on our eastern side will be open throughout, or nearly throughout, the whole extent of the thirteen states. The communication between the western and Atlantic districts, and between different parts of each, will be rendered more and more easily by those numerous canals with which the beneficence of nature has intersected our country, and which art finds it so little difficult to connect and complete. A fourth and still more important consideration is that, as almost every state will on one side or the other be a frontier, and will thus find, in regard to its safety, an inducement to make some sacrifices for the sake of the general protection, so the states which lie at the greatest distance from the heart of the Union, and which, of course, may partake least of the ordinary circulation of its benefits, will be at the same time immediately contiguous to foreign nations, and will consequently stand, on particular occasions, in greatest need of its strength and resources. It may be inconvenient for Georgia, or the states forming our western or northeastern borders, to send their representatives to the seat of government, but they would find it more so to struggle alone against an invading enemy, or even to support alone the whole expense of those precautions which may be dictated by the neighborhood of continual danger." If they should derive less benefit, therefore, from the Union in some respects than the less distant states, they will derive greater benefit from it in other respects, and thus the proper equilibrium will be maintained throughout. I submit to you, my fellow citizens, these considerations, in full confidence that the good sense which has so often marked your decisions, will allow them their due weight and effect, and that you will never suffer difficulties, however formidable in appearance, however fashionable the error on which they may be founded, to drive you into the gloomy and perilous scene into which the advocates for disunion would conduct you. Hearken not to the unnatural voice which tells you that the people of America, knit together as they are by so many cords of affection, can no longer live together as members of the same family, can no longer continue the mutual guardians of their mutual happiness, can no longer be fellow citizens of one great, respectable, and flourishing empire. Hearken not to the voice which petulantly tells you that the form of government recommended for your adoption is a novelty in the political world, that it has never yet had a place in the theories of the wildest projectors, that it rashly attempts what it is impossible to accomplish. No, my countrymen, shut your ears against this unhallowed language. Shut your hearts against the poison which it conveys, the kindred blood which flows in the veins of American citizens, the mingled blood which they have shed in defense of their sacred rights. Consecrate their union, and excite horror at the idea of their becoming aliens, rivals, enemies. And if novelties are to be shunned, believe me, the most alarming of all novelties, the most wild of all projects, the most rash of all attempts, is that of rendering us 
in pieces. In order to preserve our liberties and promote our happiness. But why is the experiment of an extended republic to be rejected merely because it may comprise what is new? Is it not the glory of the people of America that, whilst they have paid a decent regard to the opinions of former times and other nations, they have not suffered a blind veneration for antiquity, for custom, or for names? to overrule the suggestions of their own good sense. The knowledge of their own situation and the lessons of their own experience. To this manly spirit, posterity will be indebted for the possession and the world for the example of the numerous innovations displayed on the American theater in favor of private rights and public happiness. Had no important step been taken by the leaders of the revolution for which a precedent could not be discovered, no government established of which an exact model did not present itself, the people of the United States might at this moment have been numbered among the melancholy victims of misguided counsels, must at best have been laboring under the weight of some of those forms which have crushed the liberties of the rest of mankind. Happily for America, happily, we trust, for the whole human race, they pursued a new and more noble course. They accomplished a revolution which has no parallel in the annals of human society. They reared the fabrics of governments which have no model on the face of the globe. They formed the design of a great confederacy which it is incumbent on their successors to improve and perpetuate. If their works betray imperfections, we wonder at the fewness of them. If they erred most in the structure of the Union, this was the work most difficult to be executed. This is the work which has been new modeled by the act of your convention. And it is that act on which you are now to deliberate and to decide. Publius. Thank you for listening to The Federalist Papers by James Madison, John Jay, and Alexander Hamilton, read by David Grizzly Smith. The full text of the Federalist Essays is available at congress.gov, among many other places. The theme music, Johann Sebastian Bach's Prelude in C Major, is provided by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. Comment at grizzliesgrowls.com or at speakpipe.com forward slash grizzliesgrowls. These recordings are offered under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, 3.0 license. That means please make copies. Please share these recordings, but don't change them, don't sell them, and do tell people where you got them. If you like this presentation, leave a comment and a rating on iTunes or anywhere else you can. Blog about it, podcast about it, tweet about it. Tell everyone, and thank you. Thank you for listening to Stories from the Hibernation. Theme music for the series is Canon in D by Pacabell, performed by Owen Poteet of owenpoteet.com. Comment or contribute on the website at grizzly.libsyn.com. This program is offered under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Thank you.